chapter. We're going back and revisit a little bit about where we were Sunday. Surviving the storm. Mark 4.35. That day when evening came. Now, hold on just a minute. And I, I know we're online and stuff. But let me ask you. Anybody got a, a testimony tonight? A quick testimony you'd like to share? I don't want to take that away from you. It's so important. If you're watching online, you can also send us your testimonies. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. And I paused on this on Sunday because it just jumped all over me that I, I'm not necessarily one of the disciples right now in the boat with Jesus wanting to wake up Jesus. Wake up, Jesus. I'm, I'm the guy in the little boat outside the boat yelling, wake him up. Because if your storm calms, then my storm will calm. And when you become a parent, a grandparent, or you, you, you have a business and you love your employees and, and things start happening in their lives, it affects your life. And if everybody's storm starts being calmed, it'll calm your storm. So it is my prayer. I've, I've lived in a place of the last two years of almost frustration because of the floods and the things we're having to deal with. Because it's not just our church, it's my home. It's David's home and Joseph's home and Josiah's home and my son Josiah and Judah's home. And now Jill's there. It's, it's, the, it's our house. It's where we're at. So there's a frustration that's built into it. And then because of that, and then the church and the things that go on in the church life, and I'll, I'll press on a little bit more with that, but I'm just telling you, it's like I celebrate it anytime somebody's storm is calmed. When somebody goes through surgery and it's a success. When somebody was put into hospice care and, and they lived through it and still living and doing well and they're getting better instead of worse. These little storms that take place in our lives, when they get better, I get better. And you, you do that because you love people. You're connected with people. And so you, you want to see the best for them. Uh, a furious squall came up. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And again, I, I said Sunday, I, I would love for Jesus to have a parental moment there when I don't you care. Because I know at one time or another, if you as a parent or grandparent, you've heard your kids say, well, don't you care? You, you've provided for them. You gave them shelter. You gave them food. You gave them something to drive. And they cop out on one day. They had a bad day with you. And they're going to ask you I don't care. I'd have thrown their butts in the water right then. I'd have seen if they could swim or walk. Amen. I, I'd have whooped up something. Hallelujah. They'd been lightning popping that boat. Okay, anyway. Jesus didn't do that. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Peace, be still, another translation. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? And I said, Whenever you face a storm, you're either going to face it with faith or you're going to face it with fear. And the battle is always there, and it's always real. It's always going to be real in your life. And so he said to them, why are you so afraid? Again, they have seen miracles, so why were they afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey, obey him. It hits me that he said to them, you, you still have no faith. In other words, a journey with Jesus is to build your faith. When you get born again, it takes faith to get saved. I understand that. We're saved by grace through faith. But after that, there are things that come in life that your faith has to be built up for. You've got to believe God for your future. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. So I'm hoping for something, believing for something, so I've got to keep my faith alive. Now, storms, they happen. And what I remind myself is, is they happen to all of us. They, nobody's exempt. Nobody, you know, your storm I know is bad to you, but perspective tells me there are worse storms out there. And so I try to get a different perspective, see things from a different viewpoint. They are unexpected when they happen. You didn't expect the storm. If you did, you'd have probably prepared for it a little better. Preparation, though, is a part of it. Uh, you know, for, in other words, before a storm hits, you want to prepare if you know it's coming. We had time to prepare for Harvey. When Harvey hit as a storm, we knew it was coming up the coast. Amelda, nobody had time for it. Amen. It hit too fast. Second is during the storm, you've got to learn to stand. You just got to stay put. I, I know uh, physically our guys just stayed put and made it through it. Others did the same thing. Uh, uh, but, but standing through a storm of life, when it's your kids, standing. It's a hard thing sometimes to do. When after you've done all you can stand, because you want to do something to make things different. And there are times the best thing I can do is just stay stood as a dad, a father, a pastor, a grandpa. Just stay, stay stood. Amen. So they can see that you're a beacon in, in, a, in, a, in a lighted place. And they can get hope. Just, just stand to it. And, and then also understand after, clean up and go on. 
Many times we forget the clean up part. But that cleaning up and going on can be refreshing. It can be restoring to you. And so we talked about Sunday that what storms reveal in our life, they reveal the strength of my commitment. Am I really committed? Am I committed to relationship with people? Am I committed to the house of God? Am I committed to Christ? Am I committed to my business? Am I committed? So it's going to show that. It reveals the strength of my commitment. It reveals the level of my maturity. When you got born again, and this is what I mentioned, that there are a lot of athletes and, and showmen and musicians that are getting saved and born again. It's a great thing. But the bottom line is, how mature are they? When the, when the storms come, when the seed is sown in the ground and the sun comes up, the Bible says they, came, they sprung up with joy, but on the flip side, they gave up too quick. And many times in life, that's why you got to pray. So on, uh, on, on Sundays, other times, I'm praying for people. I, I, I appreciate the lifted hands. I appreciate people praying and asking Jesus in their life. But I want to see, is this for real? Are you going to stay with it this month, next month, a year from now, five years from now, 20 years from now? It ain't nothing like being with a, you know, I was with Janie Watkins a while back, and Janie been with me for over 20 years. And I was with her the other day, and I realized this woman has been serving God for about 60 years. You know, when you get that kind of rock-solid stuff in your life, you've gone through it, those of the people you want to get around and talk to and say, how'd you do it? How, how did that happen? Next one, it re reveals the healthiness of my attitude. The only thing you can change, that, that deals with offense again. It's up to you to be offended. Offended has to do with attitude. So all of us at one time or another, we have opportunities for offense. It doesn't make you um, immature to be offended. It makes you human. But you've got to learn to shake it off. You've got to learn how to deal with it. You can't let that snake bite you and hold on to you. You've got to get rid of the venom. It's going to happen. It's okay if you even say, I've told God, I'm offended with it, frustrated with it, frustrated, frustration. You know what frustration is? Frustration is the doorway to breakthrough walks through. Let me say it again. Frustration is the doorway breakthrough walks through. When life is easy and good, you don't, you're just cold, fooling around. You're just going along. But when you're frustrated, when you're aggravated, when you're hungry for God, when you want a little bit more, when you're frustrated, with, things start changing. Breakthrough starts coming. I'll prove it to you in just a few minutes. I see Cheryl. She's writing it down. She's getting it down. It hit me when I walked in. I wrote it down here when I, when I came up. But the disciples, they're frustrated. They're, fr they're seasoned sailors. And it's not like a seasoned sailor to have to go down and wake up a novice and ask him for help. They've been on the ocean, I mean, on the seas before. They've felt the water break over the bow before. They know all about this. But this one here, I don't know what they did before they met Jesus, but they must have made it through somehow. But now you've got another squall, and they would come down out of the mountains and move across the water, churn it up like a washing machine, and here's Jesus in the stern of the boat. Wake up, Jesus! Don't you care? Amen. How many know they were frustrated? And when Jesus got up and calmed everything down, breakthrough walk through the doorway it's an amazing thing when you see it in life i'm going to tell you as a human there's times you get frustrated with your health you're going to get frustrated with your finances you get frustrated with with things in life and all of a sudden you're going to walk through a doorway called breakthrough and something's going to happen in your life because it's the first thing and i'll be honest with you i would rather preach to a group of hungry frustrated people give, give me give, give me five people in this church I'd rather be here than preaching to a thousand people in Chicago that don't care. I just want to be around people who are hungry for the word. They want the word, and they're frustrated with some things in life, and they're looking for breakthrough. Oh, come on, come on. Reveals my level of teachability. How much you, how, what did you learn this time? See, if we didn't learn anything through this last flood, through the first flood, then we, we, we're in trouble. We learned some stuff. Now, there are things that we cannot do. We cannot build every building up five foot in the air. It's not financially feasible. And then all I think about is I'd have to walk upstairs for the rest of my life, and I don't want to do that either. The next thing I realized, I can't put a dam around the property because it came over everybody's property. Amen. So I just gave, if I dam up my, uh, put a, di a big old wall around my property, it's just going to flood somebody else's property a little bit more. You know, so, what we, so we're going to do everything we can to secure our buildings, get things ready. But also in life, what is it I can do? How is it that I can do to manage life a little bit better, make it a little bit better? And what have I learned? What have I picked up on? First off, people are, are really a tremendous asset. I've learned that. Man, people are, even, even uh, the, the smaller hands that have made it out, the people I've seen come in and, and through, through life. When we did this building, it was like ants all over this building. 
I mean, they were building stuff and adding things. They had ideas. I mean, ideas was formulating. There was some, we had pictures of it. What a wonderful thing. But the worst thing we can do is settle into our pew and act like, well, we don't have to do anything else. Because it's up to us to fill this house. Amen. To go out into the highways and byways. So what do you do, Pastor, when you're discouraged? What happens when the storm hits? What, what, what's going to, what, what's going to, or, or, or when you're just getting wet all the time? Let me tell you, the word is overwhelmed. Overwhelmed literally means to be buried beneath a huge mass. What was it the disciples were concerned about? The waters breaking over the bow of the boat. They were concerned about the water. It's one thing when the boat's in the water, another thing when the water's in the boat. Amen? So water's breaking over the boat, and they were concerned about being overwhelmed, to, to be pushed down. Life can try to do this, especially if too many things come at you at one time. Handling things as they come gives you the ability to keep things from piling up. This, to me, this, this little paragraph is how I have to live my life. Uh, this morning, we got so much work done, but mentally, I was thinking, okay, what's next? How are we going to do this next? Where are we going to go? How are we going to every build, We were in every building today, going through it, looking at, uh, writing down things. What, what needs to be done? How, how do we fix this? Then I get a phone call to go over here, and I got to move this one. But everything we do in life has a, and then you got your kids. You know, my kids are, uh, Johnny and Katie came back with their dogs, so they're there. And Jill's there with her dog, and, and I'm there with my dog. And uh, you know, we have no fences. We got kennels. And, 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 and you got you got to somehow manage the peace. Okay? So me and my dog, we rule. The rest of y'all, y'all just find wherever you can. So, but, but you got to manage. And then this weekend, my daughter comes in and my grandkids will be here. So be ready. Colton will be here on Sunday. And Cassie. It's going to be fun. I'll act like I'm a little different. Because Papa will come out at me. It just happens. It's a good thing. Everybody say it's a good thing. But be careful about being overwhelmed. Literally, it means to be buried beneath a huge mass. Don't, don't just get by, by by making a living. I have to make a destiny. So do you. We've got to leave a legacy. So every one of us, Joseph rose up out of the pit. We talked about this to rule the land. So there, so there is no excuse. You can say it was rain. It was a too, boat was too small. Anything else. But no more excuses. What would you do if you thought you could not fail? This is a great question. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? One, just do something. Just do something. You know, we try to hide behind our faith. Somebody else is going to win somebody to Jesus. Uh, I, I, I want to do everything I can to win as many people as I can to Jesus. But you're going to be able to reach people I can't reach. So you have to go after them. You can't be afraid to talk to them. What if they reject me? What if they don't? You know, the hardest thing in my life is to talk to my dad about Jesus. To tell my dad, Dad, look, unless something changes in your life, me and you are not going to see each other hereafter. I'm not going to be able to be with me. Me and Marie had this talk about her dad. It's, it's so important. So I talked with him, and it, it shocked me because he just simply looked at me and said, well, what do I do? Well, <laughs> and mother's sitting right there. Mom falls right into it. And dad uh, prays with me and gives his life to Christ. My mother does. Then my brother does. My sister, who's already gone to heaven, she had such a simple faith toward God. Amen. And all these things. Uh, and, and I hear my mother's vernacular changing. I'm praying for you. I'm praying to things. You know, I'm, this is gospel picking up. Then these are people who can't even find a church. They couldn't have. Now my dad's gone. My sister, uh, and my sister-in-law, my nephew. My nephew just had his first baby. So, I mean, it's just like I'm seeing, that, you know, this is a God thing. But you have to do it. You, you have to reach out and do something. In other words, you do what you can do. Let God do what he can do. But don't you try to do what only God can do. And don't you expect God to do what you're supposed to do. Everybody catch that? We'll say it again to you. You do what you can do. Let God do what he can do. Yeah, you know, if you're mad at somebody or, or offended with somebody, I mean, you, know, you say, well, God, if you'll do so, if you'll work in their life, and God's saying, I told you, <laughs> you go to them. You go, go, go to, the actual scripture said go to him, not them. Quit telling everybody else, go to that one person, deal with it. But don't you try to do what only God can do, and don't you expect God to do what you're supposed to do. So if I'm supposed to do something, okay, God, I said, what am I doing? I'm going to go. Everybody say, go. So it's the gospel, the gospel. I got to preach the gospel. I got to go. I got to get unstuck. I got to keep moving. We'll talk about that when we hit Sunday. Amen. I believe you're built for it. You're built for overcoming. God made you overcome. You got up. You walked. You learned to walk. You fell down. You got up. You fell down. You got up. We're made to do something in life. Your faith is forged for it. Your, your faith has been forged. You've been through the fire. Many of you have. You've, you've dealt with life. You've, you've taken the punches and you got back up. That forging was important in your life. It made you a, a metal, tough metal to handle life. Now you've got to live for it. The next thing is don't beat yourself up. 
We're so hard on ourselves. That's why I brought out Samson to you on Sunday because many times we think Samson, you know, didn't make it to heaven. I'm telling you that he did. Don't beat yourself up. You're harder on yourself than anyone else is. You begin to get into the mentality that, that you've got to make things work at all costs. Pretty soon the enemy has you over. They're doing things that are not right, but now the end justifying the means. God didn't create any of us to beat ourselves down. And that, you know, you just can't do it. I can't beat you down. Don't let anybody else beat you down. Don't you do it. Encourage yourself. I love what David did in 1 Samuel chapter 30. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, when I say encourage, that means there's a time the preacher ain't around. There's a time peers ain't around. There's times that, that prophets ain't around. Ain't nobody else, but you're going to have to encourage yourself. And I don't care how famous you think you are or how popular you are, you're going to find yourself alone sometime, and you're going to have to look at yourself and say, Come on, man, get up from there. Quit acting that way. Encouraging yourself. Sing to yourself. I, I, you know, I, we've been so distracted over Imelda over the last six weeks now. I've, I've had little time to study, little time to read. Uh, almost my whole uh, library, uh, I did not say the whole library. I had a library of books that I've collected for 30-something years, and uh, I'd say eight-tenths of them are destroyed. I have just a little bit left. I even bought a book at the last conference I was at so I could find something new to read and study on. Because I, I, I miss my old books. I, I, I like the Internet. And that's cool. But I miss getting a book down and looking through it and reading it. and uh, See what I underlined in 1993. You know? Just see. I like to go back on things like that. David was a man who feigned madness. He ran from King Saul. He ended up at a, at a living with the Philistines, which is crazy. He actually was staying with a place at Gath which was where Goliath was from. Imagine that. I mean, this is an amazing story. So he's there, and, and so he would go out with his mighty men every day to raid, and they thought he was raiding against the Israelites. He'd go kill every Philistine in another village somewhere, and wipe them out, and then he'd come back in, and they're like, yeah, we did good. You know, got blood on our swords. We're good. Well, it so happens that one time when he was out, when David and his men reached Ziglag, they found it destroyed. That's where he lived by fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength to, to weep. They lost all their strength in crying. David's two wives had been captured, uh, Ahinam of Jezreel and Abigail, who was beautiful, by the way, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and his daughters. But David found strength in, in the, uh, the Lord his God. Listen to me. Stay there. Go back to that if you would, Mike. This is important. First off, all our children are important to us. And when we think somebody has hurt them or, or, or the reason for their captivity, then we turn against them. It was not David's fault, but David being the leader had to take the brunt. They spoke about stoning him. They wanted to throw rocks and beat him to death with it. They were mad. Here's a man who was a valiant leader. They loved this man, but now because of their kids, and I will tell you this, we all love our children, but be careful about putting too much faith in your kids at times. And, 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 and losing a great friendship because of a, something a knothead kid did. You just want to throw that out there. I don't know if that means anything to any of you, but, but I've, just, I've seen it in life before. Now, they're mad at it. They're upset. So David is frustrated. It's in his frustration, he can't get his kids back. His men, now I'm all alone now. I don't know what else I'm going to do. So the scripture says, go on, brother. Then, then David said to Abiathar, the priest, went to the preacher, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord. I don't know exactly what ephod was, if it was, if it was a, 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 a breastplate with, with, with emeralds or diamonds on it. It's been questioned about what it is. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Instead of sitting there and having a pity party, instead of sitting there going, Well, my kids and wives are gone too. Pick me up a rock or stone me or get me out of here. Anything like that. Instead of being that way, he turned and it began to ask him. He said, now, God, is there anything I should do here? Should I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, God said. He answered, you will certainly overtake them and, and succeed in the rescue. Next. He led, down, he led David down, and this is kind of cool. And I don't know if I missed a, a spot there, but the Scripture says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Again, everybody's got to learn when you're wet. You've got to ask God, what do I do next? 
Frustration is a doorway breakthrough, walks through. So David heads down. He led David down, and there they were scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men, and they rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. The thing that hit me with this was the frustration that David went through. And because of the frustration, he got up and he did something. He prayed. He did what God told him to do. And what happened? Breakthrough. Walked through the doorway. Amen. He had this great breakthrough. And here he is with everything. And if I, I skip some verses here, but there's some of the men didn't go. Some of the men didn't go and fight. David just left them. He said, as a matter of fact, they chased him and got tired. And they were tired. And David said, leave them there. We'll keep fighting. And then after they fought and got all the plunder, they brought the plunder back. Watch this. The men that were with David through it all said, we ain't sharing none of this plunder with them guys. They gave out too early. They sat down. They, they sat down by the brook. They, they wore out on us. We're not going to share. And David said, we're sharing everything with them. And this reminds me of church life so much. There are times in life you go, we don't want to share. We're the ones that built this. We're the ones that set all this up. We're the ones that paid for all that. They just showed up, Pastor. Invite them in, love them, and let them receive what you got, grace. Amen? Boy, that's good. Amen. Next, have a friend. When you're going through a storm, have a friend, a confidant that you can share hard times with. I have found that without my friends, I don't think I could make it through life. All through my life, it's been my friends that have pushed me through, that's helped me up, that picked me up, that has stayed with me. They're no long rangers in God's kingdom. Society says if, you know, if you're a strong man, you don't need anybody else, that's a lie. If I get wet, if I'm going through a storm, if I'm going through a hard time, I'd like for you to get wet with me. I just always felt that way. Amen. It's good to have friends along with you. Proverbs 18, 1 says, A man separates himself, isolates himself, and defies all sound judgment. Let me say something else about isolation. Isolation is what's happening right now on the Internet. And I'm not against you watching us today, and I know there are people all around the world, actually, that watch this little broadcast, which, which blesses me right off the bat. But listen to me just a minute. When you isolate yourself and you stay home, how, you can't be offended doing that. It's in relationship where offenses take place. You know why a lot of folk don't get married? They want to stay single so they don't get offended. Marriage is a great place to be offended. Amen. Offenses are coming, but it's going to be up to you to whether you take the offense. Uh, in church, there's always going to be something in church life that's going to offend. It'll be up to you to take the offense. It's always that way. In, throughout life. Proverbs 18, 24, a man that hath friends has to show himself friendly. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Of course, when it's Christ Jesus. But a friend sticks, you got to be friendly. I can't make you be friendly. You know, for years and years and years, any church I've pastored has been known as one of the friendliest churches that anybody ever been in. Did you know I was voted the friendliest guy in my whole high school? It's not an accident that you're being friendly because I'm friendly. And if I'm being friendly and you're not being friendly, I'm going to say something to you. Because you need to be friendly. Why? Be for your own sake. You're going to go through a storm and you're going to need friends. Amen. Something's going to happen in your life and you're going to need somebody to help you up and help you out. So if you ain't got friends, how are you going to do it? I, 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 I Get mad if you would. But I'm telling you, I'm frustrated with people who will not be friendly and wonder why nobody will help them when they're going through trouble. Right. Where's the church at, Pastor? I mean, go, nobody likes you. <laughs> you won't be friendly. You're like hugging a porcupine. You spit icicles every time you're around. All you've got is negativity, and you wonder why? Just say it. It's why we need the body of Christ. We need the body. No matter how strong your arm is, it is no good if it's not connected to the body. It is good for nothing. People that hop churches, not good. They, they never find a body. You got to stick to it. You know, even the pinky is needed. The scripture says that one 
will set a thousand to flight. Two, two will make ten thousand run. Speaking of spiritually speaking, so one can send a thousand devils running. Two can spend, send ten thousand devils running. Y'all go back during uh, uh, the uh, the war that we fought in Iraq. The, the, they sent over some Cajun commandos. A large group of Iraqi soldiers are moving down a road south of Basra when they hear a voice call out from behind the sand dune. One Louisiana Cajun soldier is better than ten Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda commander quickly orders ten of his best men over the dune. Well, upon a gun battle breaks out and continues for a few minutes in silence. The voice once again calls out, One Louisiana Cajun is better than 100 Al-Qaeda. Furious, the Al-Qaeda commander sends 100 troops over the dune, and instantly a huge gunfight commences. After 10 minutes of battle, again silence. The Cajun voice calls out, One Louisiana Cajun is better than 1,000 Al-Qaeda. The enraged Al-Qaeda commander mustered 1,000 fighters, sent them over to the other side of the dune. Rifle fire, machine gun, grenades, rockets, canyon fire, cannon fire ring out. A terrible battle is fought in silence. Eventually, one badly wounded Al-Qaeda fighter crawls back over the dune and with his dying words tells his commander, Don't send any more men. It's a trap. There's two of them. We're stronger together. Amen. Number four, keep focused and committed to God's word and your destiny. When you're in a storm, remember the last thing God told you. If God told you to go to the other side, you know, it wasn't a, Jesus had him get in the boat. Later on, I think it's in Matthew 14, Jesus will tell the disciples, go to the other side. And they get in the boat, and you know the story. That's when Jesus was walking on the water in the storms of the night, scared the disciples. The bottom line is, What's the last thing he told you? The last thing that he said to you. When you're in a storm, you've got to try to back up and remember. And I try to back up and say, okay, stay in the course. What is it, God, you have for me to do? Keep focused. Don't, don't let the rain rob your future. Storms are going to come and they're going to go. Rain forces you to focus if you're to survive. If you drive in a vehicle, you have been once, if you're any length of time at all, you've been caught in a rainstorm. It forces you to focus like you never have. A couple weeks ago, I was leaving out of the camp, going to Baptist and Camden Road. The, the rain was so hard. We got like two inches in, a, in an hour and a half or so. It was crazy rain. Trees were down. I think rain hit over here about the same time, about two weeks ago, Jim. I literally focused on where I was going, pulled into the gas station, turned around and came back. It was too bad to ride in. It forced you to focus. I had storms heading up to, to uh, uh, Colorado before. Water coming over the hood. So just, and j was with me. And I remember the focus we had looking for the white line so we could stay on it. It forces you. When you're in a storm, your focus gets better. It's, it's different now. Amen. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. If I, if I can stay with him. Matter of fact, one scripture says he can keep us from offense if our mind stays on him. Amen. Just keep your mind on him. God will preserve you in hard times, even if you keep your mind on him rather than the problem. Remember, the enemy will work all things to evil for those who will allow him to. God works all things for the good. Sometimes we like to have pity parties to see who had the worst week and the worst problems. Be careful with all of that. You have to get your thoughts in order. Corinthians tells us to bring every cap, every uh, it, bring into captivity every thought. Is it, the battle's in your mind. I was reminded again today. I was driving through the property. I finally got by myself, and I heard the word "spirit." It's a spiritual battle. I'm not fighting against flesh and blood, but I fight against spirits. Amen. I'm not fighting against family and friends and, and enemies. I'm fighting against spirits. Amen. So I had to go back and I started praying differently. You know, it's, I'm not mad at him. I'm not upset. This is, this is about a spiritual fight. Amen. As our church gets back on track and all these things happen, I see it as a spiritual fact. And then the last point, when you're going through a storm, nothing happens as fast as you want it to. Nothing happens as fast as you want it to. I'm pregnant. Okay. Nine months. Amen. I got a baby, right? Next 30 years. <laughs> if you're lucky. 
Amen. Nothing happens as fast as you want it to. Everyone has to learn when it's raining. Hebrews 6, 12. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. One of the worst sins that can happen to a believer is laziness. Procrastination, lazy, backing away. Press in. So I don't have a lot of strength. What you got, use it. Amen. Learn, learn to... to and, don't buckle under the problems. I'm preaching to the preacher now. My frustration level has been so high that everything I've been preaching is to me. I, when I say that, y'all think, oh, that's just a cute cliche. No, it's not. It's the truth. Amen. When I'm going through these storms, I want to see a storm calm for others so mine are better. I want to be able to handle life. I want to stay focused as I'm moving through this storm. I, I don't want to let get sidetracked. I want to remind myself I'm the pastor of the little country church, not the supervisor of another, <laughs> I could get, I promise you, I could go get a job right now as a supervisor on a construction. Because I've got experience now. Hey Amen, I'm an experienced man after, I got a resume, a resume. Hey Amen, there are some I know who have left their purpose and destiny due to hard rains and problems. Maybe they're wet, 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 I don't know. They thought they were the only ones to get wet, but it's not true. We've all gone through problems we've all had them so as you survive and you will and one day you'll thrive and as frustration mounts in your life remember that's God's way of introducing you to a breakthrough God's pushing you to somewhere else so don't go with it stand with me if you would you know what I'm looking for after a hard rain a harvest still looking for the harvest I, if things work out well, as we move towards Sunday, you want to get somebody to church here Sunday. Because I, I'm going to preach something probably you've never heard from me. Of course, I, I, probably, I try to do that all the time, give you a little something. But some of y'all have been with me so long and you won't leave, so <laughs> I'm saying the same thing twice. It's funny how we'll sing a song we know. And we'll go to a concert, and if that musician or singer don't sing the song we know, I got friends in low places. If he don't sing it, we get mad. He sings something new. The preacher tries to preach something twice. You go, I've heard that one. Well, good. Preach it along with me. <laughs> Just preach it along with me. I've got enough things to say. Father, I bless this house tonight. I thank you for your hand upon us. You're a good, good God. Yes, we've been offended with you, Jesus. Mm-hmm. We took the bait, but truth set us free. So we received that. We thank you for it. You never meant to hurt us with it. Lord, we ask you to help us to release others. And God, as we move through the USO, God, help us to stand for you and truth. We love you. The storm didn't take us out. It's going to bring us in. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Go get your kids, please.